Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us turn to one another and share the peace of Christ. our July 4th weekend. Do you know why we celebrate July 4th? We celebrate July 4th because back in 1776, they met in Philadelphia and the Second Continental Congress authorized the Declaration of Independence. And that was a pretty revolutionary document at the time. It was pretty crazy. Um, you know, during that time, in Peking, there was an emperor. There were shoguns ruling Japan. There was a sultan in Constantinople. Uh, emperors that said they ruled um, uh, absolutist monarchs in France and England and most of Europe. And so it was pretty revolutionary at the time to think that we could have self-governance. That's crazy. And they picked a man, Thomas Jefferson, who had a voice so weak he could barely be heard in the House of Commons or uh, in the in the Virginia State Legislature? But in imperishable language, he wrote a document that has been quoted back at tyrants since he wrote that in 1776. That's pretty crazy. Now I bet you're wondering why we're talking about that. Well, <clears throat> Jesus. And what he taught us and his stories that are all in this book right here are all pretty revolutionary as well. So I want to share a scripture passage with you. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For the reason Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Now that's pretty revolutionary when you think about it. Jesus is willing to die for our sins. And him doing that sets us free. Now, you know, that's, that's pretty powerful type stuff, isn't it? And so, the Declaration of Independence is not nearly as powerful as this book, but this book shows us God's illustrations of His love. So why don't we bow our heads and pray, okay? Let's clasp our hands. Dear God, 
Thank you for your revolutionary forgiveness and grace that you have always given to us. Please let us act like we are deserving and continue to extend that grace and forgiveness to others. In your name we pray. Amen. Come on up, Doug. It says Ruth. It says Ruth Welch in her bulletin, but Doug will present our moment for caring today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so a little bit of this beginning is Ruth, Ruth had her words all worked out, and then as we were talking this morning, she says, "Why don't you do it?" <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. Um, so about a year ago, in their Sunday school classes, they were talking about the idea of co-sponsoring a refugee family from Afghanistan. That was a big thing in the news of the Afghanistan's of needing a home. By the time some action was taken, however, the Afghani people were finding homes and they were moving in other parts away from this part of the United States or from Kentucky. And so as we as a church approached Kentucky Refugee Ministries, the people that were available were coming from Congo. So Ruth found in her thinking that this reminded her of some of the other things they were talking about in their Sunday school class, which was racism. So we're welcoming an African family to the United States. It seems the Holy Spirit moves within, and that's, as the song says, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Why the Congo? What's going on in Congo that we have refugees from Congo? I don't know if you know, Congo is about the size of the United States east of the Mississippi River. So if you imagine how much land it is, it's a pretty good size country. So what's going on in Congo that there's refugees coming here? It's complex. It's not an easy picture. But we remember the genocide that happened in Rwanda, right? 800,000 people were killed in the little country. The country the size of Indiana, or less, next door to Congo. And so, as that genocide was happening, the people who were being killed fled into the Congo. And also, the people who had been doing the killing fled into Congo and were hiding out in Congo. Well, they were hiding. Where did they fly, fly to? You know, there's not cities. It's the jungle, and there's villages here and there, and so they're finding villages and small places to, to be able to hide. And so, how do you how do you expect a, 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 an un, un, a people who have left their home to survive? They have survived by getting help from other people, or hiding in the woods and in the, in the forest and finding things to eat. So then. As they're there in the, in the Congo, uh, you, the people, the, the armies from Uganda and Rwanda went into Congo to try to chase them out because they had killed 800,000 people, or at least many of the people who were in, in, in the force of Congo. Well, that made Congo, the government of Congo, upset because here's people invading their country to do war. And so all of a sudden you've got conflict going on and you imagine Shelbyville, all of a sudden there are people from all different places that show up and they're finding places to live and they're fighting. You know, what do you, it's crazy. People are getting killed. This, this family that's coming, it's a woman and her three kids. I don't know, I don't think people know why she doesn't have a husband. Maybe he was killed in all this conflict. Who knows you know, what their, their history is. But there's just conflict going on and so people they flee from, from there and they end up being refugees. There's another element of this conflict that, that I think you, that, that, that is happening there that causes conflict to, to go on. 
Uh, who, how many people here have a cell phone? You got cell phones? Do you know what Coltan is? Coltan is in your cell phone. It's used somehow in, 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 in your cell phone. Do you know where Coltan comes from? Eastern Congo. And so in, on top of all this conflict that is between peoples and finding homes and getting food, there's people going in there to dig Coltan and digging Coltan is go ahead and get a shovel and dig into the ground and find some little bit of money from that. Of course, it costs a lot of money and when it gets it does, it's expensive. But for the people in Congo, it's very little money. But that's another element that was causing this conflict to go on. So anyway, it's a long story of why is there a refugee coming to the United States? Um, so on Wednesday, Austin, on Wednesday, Christine Munezero and her children, Sadiki, Abu, and Ami, are coming here. Yesterday, um, we went to their apartment that's in Louisville, and we had been collecting supplies to, to, to be setting up that apartment. Um, it was amazing. There was a number of people who were there. There was so much stuff you could hardly walk through the apartment, to the point where we set up the apartment and there's stuff left over that Kentucky Refugee Ministries is going to use for another apartment. Right now, Kentucky Refugee Ministries is getting this, the, the, right now they've got 67 families that are coming as refugees here. And they don't have all of them sponsored by churches, so they don't have the supplies necessary. So uh, what we're collecting is providing also for other people. So basically, we're helping set up two apartments, or two homes. Uh, Charles and Lucy Long and Ruth and I helped transport, set up the apartment. We got beds from a place to sleep, set those up. Alik Schmidt, related to this family here, was there, and her energy kind of helped keep us all going, because it was hot, even though the air conditioning, air conditioning was running, it was hot. Cindy Green's sofa looked amazing. Diane Palmer's wing chair in the living room, all, that all kind of worked out really well. We had so many lamps, you know, Jesus is the light of the world. Well, there were so many lights in this place. They got a lot of light going on. In fact, it, you know, I, there must have been 10 or 15 lamps. Um, it's, it's an amazing number of, of, of supplies that have been brought. The kitchen and the bathroom were all stocked. Uh, if you look in the bedrooms, they, they set the bedrooms up with a ni nice covers and dolls on the beds and it looks like someone had you know cleaned up their house and left and then you know, they're going to be coming back home. It's really, it looked like a lived-in place. And on Wednesday, they're coming at 4.45 at Louisville Airport. I don't know whether you all have ever had been away somewhere and you're coming back home and and you see someone waiting for you, maybe arriving at the airplane, and you feel good that they, they're there waiting for you. Here's someone who's coming across the world into a country they don't know, to a place they don't know. They don't know where they're going to live. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't know how they're going to get money. They're just fleeing. They're trying to find a place of safety. Think about that person, these people who are coming, not about yourself, but those people who are coming, and would you like to have to be welcome, even though we can't maybe communicate with them, and it says, I think Ruth was saying, I read somewhere that they speak French and English and Swahili. I don't really know for sure whether, she probably certainly speaks Swahili, whether there's some French, probably some French, maybe, I, who knows. It doesn't matter whether you can say something to them in their language. It's about being there and saying hello or welcome, even in our language, being able to, 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 to be received uh, it would be a great joy. So if you're able, if you're free uh, to be able to be in Louisville at the airport at 4.45 when they arrive, there'll be other people there, bring banners that say welcome or bienvenue in French or caribou, which is Swahili. And if you need information about writing those signs, the lady back there will be glad to help you out with that. Thank you. Thank you.
Sorry to move on.
After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. Jesus said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. For whoever will listen to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Then the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Indeed, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Our second scripture lesson for the day comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, starting with the final chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Listen carefully for the word of God. My brothers and sisters, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who think who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will be called, become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know how many of y'all remember, but there was a show that back when families only had three choices of channels to watch, most families had a favorite show and they knew when it was coming on and if they didn't sit down in front of it then, you missed it. And so our family had a few of those and I can almost remember the lineup on Fridays and Saturdays and even during the week. There was one show in the early 70s or mid-70s that I remember, and it was where I learned a particular meaning of, a, of this adage that Paul quotes, you reap what you sow. 
the story of a biracial, uh, half white, half Chinese man who is abandoned at the door of a Shaolin temple, and he became a monk, and he grew up and was run out of China, where he grew up and learned all sorts of wondrous wisdom and philosophy along with the martial art Kung Fu. And that was the name of the show, Kung Fu. He found himself in the late 19th century West, and he was searching for his father's family, and he often found himself <coughs> ousted because he was not fully white, or other reasons. Now that's the background of it, but it's really just one episode that really sticks in my mind more than anything. He was in a town, and there was a very large, angry man who had control of everybody through fear. And yet, when he was confronted, our hero, Kwai Chen Kang, confronted him and did not use violence so much as used words to listen to him. And in talking with him, the man said, I don't know why everybody is scared of me. I want to be friends, but they all run from me. And in a very slow manner, Kwai Chen looks up at him and goes, Plant rice, get rice. Plant fear, get fear. The man learned that how he approached others or how others would end up reflecting their feelings for him. And he changed. He did. Don't remember much else, but I do know he changed and people were confused. But that's what you hear with Paul here, it's this idea that, you know, what happens here, the meaning of that, when you read what you sow, has more to do with the fact that understanding that your affect in a situation will be reflected through the effect you have on others. And you'll see it in their actions, and you'll hear it in their words. If you go into a situation ready to fight, you will have a fight. If you go into a situation afraid of people, you will have a reason to fear. If you go into a situation open and trusting and having faith that all will be well, well, you'd be amazed at what you see in conflict and what happens when it diminishes. It's this idea of how you present yourself to the world that you see in both sets of scriptures. Now I'm taking it on a different twist than what you usually hear, but what, you, what I want you to think about when these 72 disciples are told, I'm sending you out. Now I'm going to go to every place you go. You're going out there to prepare the way for me. You're going out there to look for the laborers that God has in each of those towns. You're just a few, but there are others out there. So don't take anything in preparation. Don't take anything for a long trip. I mean, you better have tough feet because you're not even taking sandals. And you're going to trust wherever you go that you will be provided for. And what you will do is let the folks know who I am. The ones that say, come in and let, let, let us hear you. The peace that I have bestowed upon you by giving you a sense of faith will be bestowed on them. The ones that reject you, don't be angry. Walk out. Dust off your feet and leave that to God. That's it. If you've never lived by faith before and you're being told this and you're trying to be a good disciple, what you're going to do 
is step out and try to live by faith. And what you find out when you step out and start trying to live by faith, genuinely, is that it works. Maybe not to your liking, but you find a lot of your burden, you find a lot of the agony, the, the worry, the concerns that are so prevalent in this world that so much want to drive us to fear and try to take care of ourselves and worry about our own well-being, that falls away. And it's amazing what happens when that happens. And the 72 come back and find out, well, yeah, I was fed. And, and we were able to oust demons and, and people accepted us. And Jesus is saying, yeah, that's right. And it's not because of you. Although you have great things to show for it. It's for God. So don't forget that. These disciples have now known what it is like to live by faith. They were forced to do that. But that faith begat faith. And now they're in this cycle. And the more you live by faith, the stronger your faith gets. The more you present a life of faith, the more people are willing to trust and as they understand and trust you and your life, they begin to understand it isn't you, it's God. That's what Jesus is trying to get through his disciples' hearts and minds. Don't be afraid, but live in faith. Because that will be reflected in the lives around you. Now, Paul is talking to a bunch of folks who have already started living by faith. And he's instructing them that whereas you share the burdens as in oppression, and things you go through, the hard stuff you go through, like you may be doing your work, which is your load, or your responsibility, which is your load, and each one of us have our own individual call or responsibility to the church to the faith community, to God's, the body of Christ, you were called to a particular thing, and you have that task to do. No one else can do it, but sharing the burden that, that Paul talks about is when you get tired and you start to say, I'm afraid I need to, I need to take care of myself. This is the transgression. The transgression is forgetting that Christ is the one, that God is taking care of you. And then you begin to worry about yourself. And so you put your concerns on yourself. Basically, your flesh. Your worry. You forget about God. And when you do that, the whole cycle of faith collapses. Which is why Paul says, don't beat them up. Gently come back and remind them. You are not living for yourself. You're living for God and help them to get back to that cycle of faith. And that's what Paul is desperately trying to get them to understand. These Galatians, they've fallen away because they started being afraid because you had a group of very pious uh, Jews come in and tell them that they are not, they have to obey the laws of the, of the commandments as well as believe in Jesus. Paul is saying they don't. If you live by faith, the Spirit will guide you. You will be transformed. You'll be able to do it. You won't have to worry about all those little, little laws and make sure you do everything. That's concentrating on yourself. Concentrate on serving God. And you don't have to worry about any of this. And so he's telling the Galatians, take a deep breath. Y'all are all right. You are living with one another and helping one another. Do not be afraid. But live your faith and trust your God. We are living in a world that is being taught to look at the world through eyes of fear. We are being taught that we have to be concerned for ourselves, for our rights, for our need. We are being told that we have to fight 
to defend ourselves. What you hear in rhetoric like that, that's individualism. I'm concerned for myself, not my brother and sister. That's fear. God's not taking care of me. I'm left to, to take, for I have to take care of myself. And if that means I have to do things that go against what Jesus tells me I need to do, then I need to do it because nobody else will do it for me. When you're starting to hear that rhetoric coming out of people who claim themselves to be trusting disciples, you need to meet them with a spirit of gentleness because they are off track. At least according to Paul, Jesus. And that, I think, is the biggest danger for the body of Christ today. We have so many folks that are hearing this message of fear, of we've got to protect, we've got to save, we've got to do these things to make sure that the church maintains, that the church goes forward. You can even hear it in little churches when they say, we're all old and we're diminishing in number and where is God? We need, we're going to die if we don't do these different things. Let's change this. Let's change that. No. God gave you one church, one church, the body of Christ. You have your place there. God gave us faith communities to find our faith sustained for people to gently remind us that your fear is unwarranted. God gave us folk who are all trying to live out their call so that God is served and not themselves. It keeps us in line. That's what God wants from all of us. So that when we walk out in the middle of a world and even a church, the grand, the institution, the religion within our country and other countries, when we walk out in the midst of that and present ourselves as followers of Jesus, living a life of faith, that aspect will look, will be an oasis to the person who has found themselves as an individual, fearing. Your affect of faith and trusting in God can help them. And as you live that in your life, your faith is strengthened and it only grows and empowers you to do more. Do not listen to any voice that tells you you must be afraid that the end is coming and that we need to get people doing this or that. If it isn't what Jesus is asking us to do, like love your neighbor, to trust your God, turn the other cheek, care for one another, bless your enemy and pray for them. Those are the words of our Lord. If you're hearing something else, treat those folks with gentleness. They need to see your faith in your face. They need to feel it in your presence. So they don't have to be afraid. And they don't hear the words of the flesh. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> now let us stand and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it is in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, and Son, and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From 
Then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Deliverer. 
In every age, your Holy Spirit has led us in your ways. And therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy. O God of majesty and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. At his baptism by John, your spirit came with gentle wings, settling on him your blessing. In the wilderness, temptation, your spirit stood by with power. In his life and ministry, your spirit led him to serve the poor, proclaim freedom from sin's bondage, open eyes with faith's sight, and befriend the friendless and the outcast. In all he did and said, he announced the coming of your saving might. By his death on the cross, rising from the tomb, he broke the power of death and led the way to eternal life. Ascended to rule from on high, Christ prays for us and promises the coming peace and power. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ. We take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his return. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. This is the great mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup so that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. God, we do, we lift up, we have joys to lift up, and we have our concerns, and so we lift up in joy that Christy has a birthday, that this communion was made by human hands and given to us. That Otto and Josie are healed of their, of their illnesses and returned to their families. We also give you thanks for the, fam the refugee family that you have put in our care. Such a, such a, such a privilege it is to serve others. And Lord, we also give you great thanks that we do live in a country where worshiping you or choosing not to is not imposed, but our right. Lord, we also lift up May and Bill. We lift up Francis. We lift up Becky and the family. And we lift up those we now name in the, in the silence of our hearts. Let them sense your presence and know your peace as you act in your life and their lives according to your will. Now by the fire of your spirit, O oh God, forge us into one church, many and different people together in Christ's embrace. Set our hearts aflame with a love for the truth and the desire to do your will, so that our witness to Christ may burn brightly in the lives of joyful discipleship. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Our Father, 
which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, blessed it, and broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Take, eat. And whenever you do this, remember me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he returns again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Elders. We're going to be doing uh, intention today. Uh, if y'all will come down the center aisle, take bread, dip it into the cup, and then eat the bread. Um, that is how we will all commune together. I'm going to ask you, Libby, to help me move this back a little bit. Yeah, that should be.
Please pray with me. Loving God, you have given us a share in the one bread and the one cup and made us one with Christ. Now help us to bring your abiding grace, love, and joy to all the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us bring forth our tithes and offerings before the Lord.
world will understand a way other than fear to live. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen.